Watergate was a frame of mind as well as a burglary and a cover-up. For us, it was 300 hours of film and tape to be condensed into two. Chances are you won't see your favorite moment, but you will see highlights brought together from many different times in the hearings, happenings, and actions of Richard Nixon as these questions are pursued. Who was responsible for the break-in at the Democratic National Committee by burglars with Nixon campaign funds in their pockets? Who was responsible for the subsequent crime of trying to cover it up? The startling revelations came out over 784 days. And at the time, you, the American people, were the jury. We wondered what you thought about Watergate now, 10 years later. Did Richard Nixon do wrong? Would you vote for him today? To find out, Television Corporation of America commissioned a nationwide poll. We'll give you the results at the end of the program. But first, our story begins in the middle of the Watergate period, as the chief accuser of the president and his men looks back at the frame of mind that developed into the White House horrors. To one who was in the White House and became somewhat familiar with its inner workings, the Watergate matter was an, an inevitable outgrowth of a climate of excessive concern over the political impact of demonstrators, excessive concern over leaks, an insatiable appetite for political intelligence, all coupled with a do-it-yourself White House staff, regardless of the law. It was the spring of 1971 that Mr. Haldeman discussed with me what my office should do during the forthcoming campaign year. He told me that we should take maximum advantage of the president's incumbency and the focus of everyone in the White House should be on re-electing the president. It was decided that the principal area of concern for my office should be keeping the White House in compliance with the election laws and improving our intelligence regarding demonstrations. In Nixon's mind, anti-war demonstrators were a threat to his management of the Vietnam War as well as to his upcoming campaign for re-election. He considered the anti-war marches on Washington to be unpatriotic, unlike his own patriotism, which he traced to the original 13 states. 13 states, weak, poor, but the hope of the world, why? Because we stood for something other than power, something other than wealth. We stood for I ideal, for a moral and spiritual strength that caught the imagination of the world. Richard Nixon's dominant idea, which controlled the White House, was to get himself re-elected to another term of four more years. Well, I don't know anybody who has a better idea. <laughs> President Nixon campaigned in California with Governor Ronald Reagan, and along with his supporters, he drew protesters. The demonstrators were faced down by police, Violence broke out, and it was widely publicized that a rock was thrown at the president. If a man chooses to dress differently, to wear his hair differently, if he has any, or to talk in a way that repels decent people, that's his business. But when he picks up a rock, then it becomes your business and my business to stop him. When a president of the United States, who is the elected representative of the majority of the people in this country, is subject to rock and other missile throwing, it's time to sweep that kind of garbage out of our society. Now, could I add a personal note? The terrorists, the far left, would like nothing better than to make the President of the United States a prisoner in the White House. Well, let me just set them straight. As long as I am President, no band of violent thugs is going to keep me from going out and speaking with the American people whenever they want to hear me and whenever I want to go. I became directly and personally aware of the president's own interest in my reports 
regarding demonstrations when he called me during a demonstration of the Vietnam veterans against the war, which occurred on the mall in front of the Capitol. The president called me for a first-hand report during the demonstration and expressed his concern that I keep him abreast of what was occurring. Accordingly, we prepared hourly status reports and sent them to the president. Embattled in the White House, his upcoming campaign threatened by demonstrators. That's how Richard Nixon saw himself, and his organization reflected the frame of mind of its leader. John Ehrlichman, Chief of Domestic Operations, and Bob Haldeman, White House Chief of Staff, were the president's closest advisors. As a team, they shared fears of enemies and treason, inside and outside the government. And they worried about security leaks, some of which had already had a very real effect on the administration. In mid-1971, the New York Times started publication of the so-called Pentagon Papers, which had been stolen from the sensitive files of the Department of State and Defense and the CIA and which covered military and diplomatic moves in a war that was still going on. The implications of this security leak were enormous, and it posed a threat so grave as to require, in the judgment of the president and his senior advisors, extraordinary action. As a result, the president approved creation of the Special Investigations Unit within the White House, which later became known as the Plumbers. John Ehrlichman was responsible for supervision of this group. Ehrlichman was the White House overseer of the secret operatives, the plumbers, so named because their first job was to stop leaks. Among them, E. Howard Hunt, a man with a distinguished record with the Central Intelligence Agency, and G. Gordon Liddy, a former FBI man. And so uh, that's the reason the plumbers were formed, because the president came to the conclusion that uh, the CIA and the FBI were inadequate to perform the tasks committed to them by the acts of Congress. Excuse me. The answer is yes. Long before Watergate, the plumbers broke into the office of the psychiatrist of Daniel Ellsberg. It was Ellsberg who had leaked the Pentagon Papers to the press. What did you intend to do with the evidence so obtained from Dr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist? The did you intend to introduce it in court? No, sir. This was not intended to satisfy that need. This was intended to satisfy the President of the United States, who was saying, how could a thing like this happen? Mr. Ehrlichman, are you telling me that the break-in to Dr. Fielding's office was to satisfy the President of the United States? <laughs> well, now you've... you've uh, misunderstood me, Senator. <laughs>